You don't want to get involved in that. That's the, that's the I'm going to stay in my seat. <laughs> and hope that this gets better, right? This is, gonna, this is benign neglect. Just a little, yeah, let me know. Because uh, the kid is talking. So now the kid's not talking. You kind of hear the, 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 the choking, uh, 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 is becoming like quieter. Uh, but there's a little more activity over there, and so now you get a little interesting. You look over, and the kid's doing the, I guess you read it on that restaurant sign. She's doing one of these, right? Uh, so now what? Now there's no sound coming out of this kid. So now the whole, are you ventilating, is on the table, right? By the way, what's this kitty? Hot dog. A hot dog. Why would they design the hot I mean, it's just terrible, <laughs> terrible uh, food to design. Uh, so the kid's not talking now. The kid is still like looking bad, so maybe I get out of my seat and I go, so now what am I going to do? Now we Now we're going to do this business? No. no. What? Introduce yourself first. Oh, I mean, so. Mom. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. Introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Dr. Mukherjee and I'm going to do something to your kid now. That's fine, right? Uh, what are you going to do? Call 911. So, you know, it's a, it's a game. Uh, anything older than maybe a 12 year old, there might be an ambulance like, nearby. There might be a paramedic guy, right? right? It's not a bad idea, right? That's why in the whole chain of command or a, a survival chain for the cardiac guys, it's like, somebody call. Because, you know, I'm out in the boondocks. I got nothing with them. Uh, so that's a good thing to say. Say, hey, is there somebody around? Go get those guys. Make them bring that airway cart, whatever they're doing. But in the meantime, I might, depending on how upright the kid is and uh, how much I think they're moving, uh, give them a whack or even start to do the, the Heimlich. Yeah, let's just get the ball game to do the Heimlich. So we do the Heimlich, do the Heimlich. Mobs start to get freaked out because you've now thumped this kid and the feet are coming off the floor and like the arms are flailing around. The kid's not making sounds. But you've done like seven of these nice thrusting Heimlich things, right? And she's like got you on her phone. She's like, what do you do, right? Uh, so now what do you do? Take a break. In the kid's mouth. Tap 10, try again. Same. I guess you're going to have to get ready to do CPR. They're flailing, right? They're not speaking. Eyes are bugging. So you keep going, right? You Heimlich until either it's fixed or the kid passes out. The kid passes out, right? The kid's altered. The eyes are not bugging. They're closing. The arms are not flailing. They're slumpy. All right, that's not good. All right, so now what? Put them on the ground. Keep on doing it. They go on the ground, yeah. So, I, I mean, now I got actually got dead weight in my arms, uh, and they're not uh, doing anything. So I put them down, and I'm going to do the continue the Heimlich in a horizontal position. Yes? I guess. Well, what have I got to check at this point? Sure. I've been checking for sounds, I've been checking for activity, now I'm checking for pulse. So the kid's not breathing and is obtunded, but the heart may not have stopped. Right? So, again, enlist help. Is anybody? Medical of any kind? Does anybody check the pulse? I'd rather do one thing and not two things. Uh, put a hand somewhere on this kid. Check, get a femoral, get a carotid, get something. But if there's no pulse, then we're into CPR land. So the ambulance guys come, and they got all the kid. And you're like, cool, right? So at this point, whether or not you start CPR, it's nice if someone can look in the mouth, right? And if you have a tool to help you look in the mouth, if you've got a McGill, if you've got a blade, you're looking in the mouth not because you're about to tooth the kid, because you're trying to get the hot dog. But you don't see the hot dog. So now you're like, uh, you keep doing this business. Uh, you, the second the pulse goes out, CPR. Me, airway. So now we're into airway. Get the tube, pick the right size, pop it in. Done, right? Now I can go back to the, so what am I checking now? You start ventilating, making sure the air is going in. I'm bagging, it's not, it's not going well. Can't bag, now what? Sure you're in. in further. Again, man, Tyvo, man. Your, your hot dog is just a 3T2. Where's the hot dog? He's still I don't know. I didn't see it. But it's but I can't bag this kid. So uh, is the hot dog in the ET2? Did I spear the hot dog? Right? I, I five seat the hot dog. Uh, did I push the hot dog ahead of the ET2? Any of those is possible. Uh, so uh, if you have the ability to push something through that ET tube. If you have a stylet, a Lugia item, that would be a thing you could do, right? If I was in the ED, I might try to suction it, to see. I might try to move that tube. But eventually, and I saw a couple of people doing this business. And what was that? I was trying to write mainstem, though. Mainstem. 
So I push the tube all the way in, right? And I, I made an intentional right main stem intubation, and then, and then I pull it back to the crime. Uh, so if that catheter <coughs> is speared or pushed, I want to leave it distal in the right main stem somewhere. One lung is better than no lung, and I try to bag. All right, so I do all that. I can't see it in the tube. I, I, the tube is in. I try to go through the tube. I do the ramrod maneuver in and out. I can't bag the kid now. This is pretty bad. Uh, so now you're 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 kind of fun, uh, to be honest. With you. Uh, so what could you do as a final last thing? <laughs> if one of the lungs is occluded, obstructed, but the other one works, it can be that all the bagging and maneuvers and coughing have caused the pneumo. So attention pneumo is about the only thing you can fix at this point. So the here or here needle is about the last ditch effort uh, before you just say keep trying to bag this kid uh, and uh, keep doing CPR and transport because no one's going to give up. The so obstruction, right? What about ventilation? If I think that there's not an obstruction, a physical thing, but I can't move the air, then we do this business, right? Who's done anesthesia this year? I assume PGY1 anesthesia is still happening, right? Yeah, we go into the house. Nobody did anesthesia. Wait, wait, wait. Yes. <laughs> Somebody knows. What do they tell you? What do the, what do the <laughs> anesthesiology guys tell you? Like your first two, three days of anesthesia? Did they let you two? They don't break any teeth. What's that? <laughs> they, tell you, they tell you, you bet, if you break a tooth, you're out of the program. Yes. Uh, they tell you, this is my patient, not your patient, right? I'm responsible for this patient. Uh, but, uh, it's but way more important to learn how to bag. Way more important to learn how to bag. You guys are all think about, it's about the cords, it's about the bagging. So then they teach you this, right? And what do they say? The C ring, right? And you got to curl the fingers, uh, use all, all those last three fingers. And what are you doing? You're not pushing that mask down on the face squashing the face and flattening the airway, you're pulling the face up to meet the mask. This is, this is good stuff. Uh, I don't know why we teach this to ER docs, because we don't do that. Right? That's a great out-of-hospital EMS, I actually have to do this myself technique. That's the respiratory therapist, I'm respiratory therapist, why would I let someone else do my gig technique? If I'm in the resus bay, the ED, and I gotta bag you, because I gotta ventilate you, you bet, I gotta see both hands. If you're telling me, oh, the sack's not coming up, and you're doing the C and the one-handed business, I'm like, yeah, well, you're, you're kind of half-assing it, aren't you? Uh, both hands, right? Uh, somebody <coughs> else bags, both hands. Uh, I, I actually want to see the thumbs at the front of that thing pointing at the toes, and all the fingers curl around. And yeah, the rest, the pull-up, the jaw, that, that I agree with, that we should do. But really, in real life, we don't do the C technique much, and when I care, I go there, I both hand it. Right? Uh, so ventilation is a thing. Uh, this is awesome. Uh, the tongue and the jaw thrust and the maneuver and the nasal cannon, they're great, but a nasal trumpet, a, a decent sized one, man, it's, it's the bougie of ventilation. It's awesome. Uh, I've used one in maybe a year. Uh, I would like to use them more, I just don't get to them in time to do this. Uh, all right, who's seen this picture? This <laughs> lady's famous, right? Uh, I don't know what that little tiny slim black bar does, but you know I don't know that I recognize her anyway. Uh, what are we looking at here? We're trying to do this is the ramp position. Yeah, you guys heard of this one? Uh, I was taught that you know sometimes when the patient is big, the neck is short, uh, it's hard to ventilate these people. It's hard to line up the axes. There's so much tissue to move that they're heavy. I can't move the head. Uh, you should probably do this technique for them. Uh, and we did, and we said, yeah, that's, that's totally right. We actually get the sternum flat and line up the sternal knot to the tragus, right? And that usually, so I would always talk like shoulder towels. So I would do that. I would say, I don't have a great view, shoulder towels. And all sorts of weird things would happen. Sometimes the shoulders would be up and the head would be forward. Sometimes the head would be way back and the shoulders would be, I was never, I, I never knew what was gonna happen after shoulder towels. I, I never thought that it was definitely gonna be better. Uh, this made a lot more sense to me. It's not shoulder towels, it's incline. Uh, because uh, this girth and this girth don't match. Uh, this is the plane you want. And then the face, the sniffing position they always said, face flat to the ceiling. Like it took me like a year before I realized sniffing position was face flat to the ceiling. Uh, so this position, and they do have fancy chairs that do this, is kind of what we're doing, tragus to sternal notch. But this face is still way too inclined, right? This is the one where the head actually needs to, to come up, right? So for these planes to go. So, face flat to the, to the surface, and you know what? That helps both of those things. It helps 
the uh, ventilation. It helps your bag. Uh, it helps the intubation you're going to do. Uh, so most people shouldn't be flat anyway, right? Uh, my algorithm has become this. If the patient is not getting active CPR, why are they flat? Nobody likes being flat. They can't talk to you flat. They can't breathe flat. The lung doesn't work well flat physiologically. None of the planes work flat. All the aspirants go down flat. It's terrible. I had an overnight shift where there was a 20-year-old who was in DKA. Uh, he'd been admitted to Dutch Times. He had terrible access. And they were trying to get access on this kid. Uh, probably they should have IO'd that kid. Uh, but uh, he was awake and unhappy. And his mom was there. And they didn't, they didn't want to, I think, go there. So they were trying. They couldn't put the guy flat. They would flatten him. They would try his IJ. And he would like, he couldn't breathe. The guy was breathing like you know, a million times a minute. They'd sit him up. They said, we'll do ephemeral. He couldn't thread the femoral. They got it. They just couldn't thread it because he was 90 degrees in the bed. So I went over. I said, why are you trying to flatten that guy? He doesn't like flat. No flat. Well, you lie. So I put him in a sitting bolt upright. Right? I mean, we don't try to down them. That's a vein that's been tacked down. Trendelenburg just puts the apex of the lung towards the needle. So if you got a decent volume, why not do that? I don't think anybody should really be flat unless they're getting active CPR. And frankly, I'm waiting for a Lucas that I can put at 30 degrees. Right? Just like set it on. Uh, don't flatten them. If you don't flatten them, then why are we doing this? Right? Doing a double-handed mass ventilation to a flat patient is kind of CPR. Right? I mean, like, who else needs that? Right? If I can oxygenate you and set up other things that are going to make your breathing better, I would do that before I would right, try to mass bag you. Which brings me to this. Who loves the, the apneic oxygen? We love the apneic oxygen. The no deset thing. So I called, full disclosure, I called N O D E S A T, no deset, for like six months before someone said, I, what, what are you talking about? You know, that's that Levitan thing. So, no, it's, it's, it's pronounced no deset because mnemonics, right? So I didn't, didn't hear uh, This is the nasal apneic oxygen. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen this video. It's pretty awesome. The guy can't breathe. He's drunk as hell. They're like, do we intubate him? Do we not? You know, he's just drunk. But he's not breathing. His sat is terrible. So let's do some things. So what do they do? They put a nasal trumpet on him, because it's just secretions. Uh, they put a face mask on him. Nothing happens. They finally put him not flat, which, which helps. But, but once they put the nasal cannula on him, uh, he starts coming up. Now they're like, OK, we've got some room. But really, you know, this guy is positional. Every time he moves, he sats. Let's plan to intubate him. Uh, while they're getting ready for the intubation, the sat's coming up. They paralyze him, make him apneic, and his sat is still going up. This is like Rich Levitan's little aha moment story, right? Because he's like, I was terrified this guy was going to desat after I pushed the meds. The thing kept going up. So this is that. I'm just sucking in the O2. So if I'm going to take care of the ventilation with a machine, <laughs> then the I need to make you breathe now kind of becomes less important. So that whole thing about the masking becomes kind of a, I'm not going to do that much. right? That's going to be a very specific situation where the patient's flat enough that I can do it, needs me to do it, and I'm not worried about positive pressure in an uptight patient. Which is the ER thing of these things? Like this is the anesthesia thing. This is the oxygen, sedation. See how they're doing with the sedation. Count down from 1 to 100. Lots of vitals, nine times access, surgeon says go, paralyzed, train of force, right? Uh, it takes like 40 minutes. Uh, uh, that's not us, right? We're this. And why are we this? I think we forgot why we're that. I think I, I've read so many articles about why first pass success is better, and the malampati is better, and the view is better, and the times of uh, attempts are better, and less skilled operators get it more often that RSI is a godsend for ER docs. And that's somewhat true. I think uh, if you look overall at method used, VL, DL, who's doing it, it's the operator more than the equipment. It's the operator probably more than the kind of patient. It's not the operator more than the position. Uh, so, right, so optimizing the, the view is actually a real big thing. But I think we actually got, got held up on first pass and forgot about vomiting. Vomiting is really bad. Uh, vomiting is like, if you look at these, if you, if you review some of these cases, uh, green, the airway's all right, the patient's setting okay, we're setting up for the intubation, everything's all right, everything's all right, everything's all right, the patient threw up. And that's it. 
It's just a matter of when they're going to die. Uh, the ones we hear about never get the two because the aspiration is so massive that now you can't suction out <coughs> corn uh, from your airway. You can't pass the tube. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a, it's a mess. When you, you call it a success, man, the patient vomited, but luckily they got the airway, that's the same thing that anesthesia was blaming them for, where like, they're just gonna die of uh, hypoxic brain injury six days from now, right? They do terribly, right? They get chemical pneumonitis, they get pneumonia, they get trach, it's horrible. Uh, you can kill a guy with vomiting. That's why we paralyze him. So if the stomach is full, if there really is McDonald's in the mouth, uh, maybe we should NG before. Like, I was used to NGing after. Now they got the sedation package, and there's like Valium and Vecuronium and Rock and nine things. Put an NG tube or an OG tube. Deflate the stomach. Okay, but but I don't care so much now, right? Uh, I, I know that the cuffed tube is, doesn't protect against complete aspiration. Microaspiration is possible, but yeah, I'm not expecting a hot dog to go down there. The tube is the cuff is up. Uh, we should probably suction more stomachs before we do, if we're really worried about aspiration. Yeah. The thing is that you know, when you're giving sucks to paralyze them, you really, if you can, wait the full minute. But if you don't, then you're going to, they can still bond. So, so that's a great pearl that uh, Peter Gruber here just threw out. Uh, one of the problems isn't choosing the med, one of the problems is just letting the med work, right? We're all, the same thing that gets you the, uh, the damaging hyperventilation where you're bagging the patient at what your respirator rate is, which is really bad, don't do that. Uh, is it's, it's the same thing. I, I gave a paralytic agent, and now we're going to go. And there's a ton of gagging, and the patient's fighting and biting, and then they vomit, and then they aspirate. Uh, so actually having someone count down, 90 seconds, plus clinical signs, I saw physicalization, <laughs> something, uh, is, is a great idea, right? And then you're going to get your relaxed jaw and your better view. Uh, so that's a great point. I did not add that in my little, like, quick list of herbs. Do you give, uh, I mean, I, I heard you mention, like, I mean, value, but would you, would you give any meds before going to stick an NG tube down? So I feel like that might, or an OG or an NG, if they're before you give them meds, I feel like that might make them. So I, I don't think you should necessarily do an NG tube before getting any medication, right? Uh, I'm assuming that this is a guy who needs an airway. This is not a cooperative, happy, drink the liquid yeah. through the straw person, right? Uh, this this is a person who actually you're going to do things pretty rapidly. But we often pre-medicate right? We often give people uh, etomidate, ketamine, other induction agents, right? Uh, during that induction time, why not, right? If you're, if you're about to get a blade in your throat, if I could put an, an NG tube in before that happens, that'd be nice. I, I prefer that. Uh, Wasn't, I mean, in my experience, uh, like a non-intubated patient will often vomit when you're putting the NG tube in. So if you sedate them and so. don't paralyze them, put an NG, don't you cause them to vomit in a uh, so you can, patient? Okay, so, so when you NG to patients who are here for vomiting to empty their stomachs from their GI bleeds, happens a lot, right? Uh, the number of times even those patients uh, who, who throw up, it's not that many. Maybe it's because they've been vomiting and their stomachs empty. I don't NG to every patient I'm going to intubate, right? But I went from zero to this is the guy, right? And, and I think that if you are in the green zone of, I can actually oxygenate this patient, uh, right? So I'm going to put the nasal cannula on, put the mask down, give them the meds, count down to 90 seconds. What if you put the NG tube in on a sedated, paralyzed patient before the ET tube? We do it right after, right? Uh, so I think it's a good point. It's just a matter of kind of your comfort level. I think there are still patients uh, who uh, back in the day would have gotten deep sedation, which wasn't that deep, like first set only and pray. So they were afraid that paralysis would be a, I, I can't come back from this. And I think we're a lot better about saying, no, 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 RSI is the way to go. I don't know if we've gone too far, right? There are probably patients who should get deep sedation, not mild mini-dose stuff, but actual full pre-medication, high-dose accommodate stuff. Uh, you know, is that a patient I would NG to without paralysis? I don't know. I think, I think you make a good point. If I'm that concerned, why not let the paralytic agent go in, throw the NG tube in first, and then and then into there. That's a reasonable thing. So are you just now doing this because of apneic oxygenation? So when I had to ventilate you to oxygenate you, and I didn't have any time, um, I would actually bag through RSI because I was scared. But if I just said the stomach insufflation is bad, right, and vomiting is bad, and occasional NG tube might be good, then bagging 
with RSI is bad, right? Well, don't, I mean, don't bag that hard. So don't bag that hard. So I'm not going to push a lot of air in the stomach, but I'd like some air to go in the lung. I'm going to still ventilate, right? Because I'm worried that that O2 set. But just as you said, now I have this. So my fear of I'm going to insulate the stomach is less because now the guy's been smoking a nasal cannula and an oxygen mask for like three minutes before he even got meds, right? After meds, his sat is happy. <coughs> when I take this mask off, move the nasal cannula over, throw an NG tube, do an ET tube, you have, you have more time, right? So if that O2 set is stable and your green zone, you have time. It's not where we you know, would paralyze and then watch that sat start to drop and go, you know, 60 seconds, go, try to intubate, hold your breath. That's what I was told. Hold your breath while you're intubating the patient. When you need to breathe, you got to stop. Do you guys know that? You no, know, right? Well, it's crazy. I've heard that before. I think sometimes we run into problems with uh, lack of oxygen ports as, as the reason mm -hmm. or excuse given for, for lack of apneic oxygenation. So, so in other words, I like a nasal cannula and a face mask, but I got to choose. Well, you've got, the, yeah, you've got the BBM, you've got the non-rebreather, and that nasal cannula, ideally. Well, when you have, if you have a nasal cannula and one more, then you're done. Because the BVM and the, and the non-rebreather are a single port, right? I mean, I actually insist on that. Because the number of times I've had, I can't get the sat up, and I've had to bag them, and I'm doing all the maneuver, and I put a nasal trumpet, and then someone follows the end of the tube to the floor and goes, that, not this, please plug it in the wall, <laughs> right? Uh, that happens at changeover, that happens at paramedic drop-off, that happens at ICU transport time. Uh, I kind of am a little anal about that one. Uh, single port, it's either the mask or the non -rebreather. Okay. That's what I do. Uh, but yes, but you make a good point. Uh, I think if during intubation there's no face mask. So if you had the nasal cannula set up and then you cha changed it over, they wouldn't be pharynx all filled with oxygen in a tank, but you would certainly still have nasal cannula oxygen going on at the same time. Uh, sorry, somebody in the back. No? I don't want to keep talking over the questions. If I don't go through the slides, that's all right. We want, we want to have a discussion. No? All right. Uh, so minor segue. Uh, you're in the trauma bay, and they say, hey, is BLS coming in, CPR in progress. Someone went down. All right? And they come in, and there's a guy, and he's like riding the, the, the stretcher, and he's doing this business, and somebody's uh, doing a face mask bag, and you know, they drop, and they give you some port. Uh, just went down, clutch chest, went down the park, right? Uh, and what do you do? You're all set up and ready to go, right? Uh, there's a guy at the head of the bed, there's a strong leader guy, uh, attending is off, you know, having coffee somewhere, call me if you need me. Uh, and, and what's the person at the head of the bed do? They're all set up for information, right? So they're doing their stuff. They're, I got my suction, I got my blade set up, I got everything good to go. Uh, and then, simultaneously, access, maybe an IO, uh, please put them on the monitor, we have a SAT, what did EMS do, right? It's all happening at once. And then, when the head of the bed guy is all his race, yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Hey, okay, hold up CPR. Yeah, yeah, I'm in. We thought that was hilarious when the ER the show came out. <laughs> I'm in, bag him, stat. <laughs> at the tube with the bag. Who are you talking to? <laughs> Why do we say CAB and then insist on B, ventilation, right? Over C, circulation. And then why do we intubate when I have this awesome device in an unconscious patient, in a flat patient, in maybe a not spontaneously breathing patient? Yeah, the airway is important, but this is an obstruction guy. If he had a brain, he wouldn't be a ventilation guy. This is a C guy, right? This is a, a AED saves you in Vegas guy. So that's your priority. We all know that. It's, it's all happening simultaneously. But that airway guy who's set up, his first move, fastest move, should be open, pop open LMA, pop in patient, inflate, keep bagging, right? LMAs are great in unconscious patients. No gag reflex, good seal, don't worry about masks and squashes and things. Uh, and then in four to five minutes, when there's a 12 lead, a monitor, access, an assessment to whether the guy's cold and mottled or a cath lab Rossi patient, if you think it's a clever thing to do, please intimate that patient. And guess what? You're just pre for a while. 
So I think that this and the iGel, it's a lesser used funny looking sticky cousin, uh, are actually really underutilized when we resuscitate patients. If it's not a primarily airway thing, don't go to the tube, go to the <coughs> LMA. And it's nice because we don't use them enough, right? It's just to get hands on, get them, get them wet, get them dirty. So the only thing about that, Doc, I, I recently had an experience of a guy who came in actually to Weiler when I was with your Stevo, who were arrested right in front of us. It was primarily a C problem, and did exactly that. Just bagged him, not with an LMA, but just from the head of the bed, and really focused on like you know running the circulatory part of the resuscitation. And then like 10 minutes in, he vomited it into his airway. And I thought, well, I guess maybe that's partially the wisdom too of doing these things in tandem, even if it's not, you know. So, so again, if, if this guy is, is, is sick and you want a definitive airway, you can take that airway. Taking it, rushing to take it in the two minutes that he gets there, instead of the five to ten minutes after he's been there, is a different thing. Who sent an awake and really sick STEMI to the cat lab? Most everybody, right? But like sick, like STEMI, ectopy, uh, VTAC arrest, shock back, woke up, please don't do that again. Some, someone pushed Lido or Ami on this guy and they take him up, right? We don't take care of it. Vomiting is common, right? We don't take care of it, right? They're not the same peri-intubation, vomiting into my airway I'm holding open kind of risk because they have a brain, right, for the most part. Uh, but also, yeah, we kind of accept that that's a possibility. Uh, you ever got shock a guy and then get him all packaged for a cat and then he goes back into VTAC or VFib and you got to shock him again? The first time that happened to me, I thought it was a bizarre thing, and then I started asking. They're like, "No, that happens all the time." Which kind of makes sense. Your primary problem is, you know, I got a blocked up artery and have an heart attack. Until that's fixed, you've proven that VTAC is a thing that happens with your heart attack. Until they open you on the table, it's probably going to happen again. So sure, get your meds, you know, and your mag, your uh, light and whatever you got. But uh, what I was told, and, and then I taught this in a debrief. And then the next time it happened to me, I didn't do it. And the resident went and said, you didn't do the thing you said you should do. Uh, which is, you shock the guy, you take the monitor, you put it on the bed, because it's going up with him, right? And you recharge that sucker. You say, you are in charge of shocking that guy. Only you will hit the button that says shock, and you will tell everyone, please clear on the shock. But it's going to happen. So you just recharge it up and leave it there. And everyone freaks out for like 30 seconds. Go, it's beeping. You know, it's just relax, right? Uh, and then when he goes into VTAC, that person goes, that's VTAC. Everybody clear, and they get shot in like no time, and they wake up. And now you're not intubating the patient who's, uh, who's unconscious and uh, has no airway, right? Uh, so I do that. This other, the other thing I did that actually was used by our cardiology fellow, came back down and told us it was used, is I take an LMA, and I put it on the patient's chest as they go. Because what do they have with them, right? They got that monitor to shock them, and they got a med box, and a cardiology fellow. They don't have anesthesia, they don't have ER. When that guy doesn't wake up, they're going to say, oh, I need to debate him, and they're going to do all the stuff I said isn't a CAB thing. And what if they had an LMA? They can see it there and go, I bet that goes in the mouth, and suddenly the guy <laughs> can get bagged and go and get the cath lab table where he needs to be. So I tell myself, and I have only accomplished 50% of what I tell myself, LMA on the chest, monitor recharged. Because that's a CAB guy. Yeah, it is important also to know how to do an LMA. Because it is, you can't occlude the airway if you don't hug posteriorly and, and you pick the wrong yeah. size, you yeah. overinflate, it moves out of the way, go why is he not satin? Yeah, so I think just to kind of yeah, so use them, it's you know, just right crack them open. Yeah, it's not that's a in Absolutely. anesthesia for the short surgeries, they'll use LMAs for the you know 45 minutes or whatever it is, sure. or the longer surgery. Right, so so it, it kind of makes sense, although I'm sure they would freak out when it happened that the cath team wouldn't automatically stop what they were doing and go, someone take that out of my oxygenated patient so uh, before I cath them, right? They would just go, should someone call out to take care of that and keep doing what they're doing? That'd be nice. Meds. Time. Keep going. How are we doing? We good? You're right. Um, I don't know. We spend a lot of time on meds. I don't spend a lot of time on meds because I, I grew up on sucks, and then in this place, as soon as they woke up from the sucks, you gave them Valium and Vecuronium, and that was 15 years ago, but still, uh, that's what it was. Now it's you know, Brocuronium or Succinylcholine, uh, now it's uh, a Choose Your Induction Agent, No Automate for Sepsis, or you know, Law of Ketamine. You guys should use the thing that isn't used in your department. Sucks is still the king at LIJ where I work, 
And so when I do a red critical shift, I tell people, if we're in debating, we're using rock today. The same way that if we're going to put a, I put a shoulder in yesterday with a resident who was like, yeah, everyone talks about different techniques. Uh, I do traction, counter traction. I get somebody to pull on that side, I pull on this side, it goes in, no must, no fuss. Uh, and I said, great, you're not allowed to do that today, and you're a single provider, and no one's going to help you do it, you got to do it on your phone. And then he Cunningham technique to the guy, uh, right? That's that stare into my eyes, relax technique. It was great, it was awesome. Uh, no conscious sedation, lie on the joint, done. Uh, so for this, I encourage you to just try to get comfortable with other meds. When there's a shortage, which happened, there was no time of day in the country for a little while, and the residents went, what the hell, right? Uh, there's still one for Paragol. I don't know what happened to Paragol, it's great. Uh, so what do we think about the meds? Um, if the patient's in shock, uh, how does that change my peri-intubation medication approach? Less sedative, more paralytic. Sepsis, trauma, sorry? Less sedative, more paralytic. Less sedative, more paralytic. Okay, I love that answer. Um, if I gave propofol to everyone in the room, weight-based, what percentage of you do you think we had hypotensive? Who thinks all of you? <laughs> all of you, wow. Who thinks close. half of you would get a little hypotensive? One, one propofol. Who thinks uh, about a quarter of you? Okay. The answer is, I have no idea. I've never done it. Uh, no one would ever let me do it. My guess is, none of you, to like, if we did enough residents over enough time, one of you uh, would drop their pressure. Because you're like caffeinated young people who woke up and came here early in the morning. You're not sick people. For them, I mean, you know, physical. <laughs> Jones. <laughs> That's uh, uh, so, uh, so I would say, listen, uh, uh, I would say, I used to say, listen, uh, everything is the dose. If you are sick, you don't have reserve. What's a good dose of ketamine? Oh, I don't know. Uh, IM 2 to 4, uh, IV 1, uh, low dose IV 0.5, but I don't want to be in that middle zone K hole. How about 0.3? Uh, and then I gave somebody 0.15 and they went apnea and they intubated them on their way to the balloon pump. Um, I don't know. They were really sick. So this is the Paracelsus tool, right? Uh, everything is dose. Air is toxic. It just depends on how much and how, how long you get it. Water is toxic. Uh, everything's toxic, right? Uh, there's formaldehyde in my vaccines. Yes. And in your food, and in your water, and in your body. And a lot more of it after you do anatomy as a, as a, as a medical student. It's, listen, toxins are real, but uh, uh, toxins that you detox from are not real. Uh, so I used to give people that speech about be very careful about your doses, definitely underdose sedatives in your very sick people, and then overdose your paralytics. Because you got you got no circulation and you gotta feed the body the paralytic, right? So go high on the sucks and the rock, go low on the sedatives. Except for this. Right? The white stuff is really beloved by my Mickey. All they do is glide scope and all they do is propofol. It's recipe, it's checklisted, it's video. They go program and they get to, and they review them. So from a watching what we're doing standpoint, it's really awesome because they review every intubation. The attending always takes a look before he gets out and lets the fellow or the resident do it. Uh, and every MICU attending can say that they have attempted, looked at, and performed more intubations in the last year than I have. And I'm supposed to be taking care of like really sick people and intubating them before they go to the MICU, right? But I think Paul Mayo in my MICU, regardless of the nice system they put together, is crazy for using this drug as his go-to drug in sick people, right? Uh, you, you guys, you know, blogophiles and wine guard aficionados, and I look at the <laughs> Emperor podcast from that time. A couple people heard of that guy, yeah, other than Weingart, Emperor, no? Uh, so he's got a great podcast uh, and, and a little blog about um, uh, the laryngoscope is a murder weapon, I think it's called. Uh, and, and they talk, talk about medication, and it's a really nice overview of this is how I would do the meds. And he's got this little story, when I was in shock trauma, right, when Scalia taught me and handed down the knowledge, he made us use propofol even in very uh, hypertensive patients, and we learned to be careful with our meds. We learn that dose matters. We learn how much propofol to give uh, to, to make the patient not die. And the paper in 2012, I want to say, that's in an anesthesia journal, out of shock trauma, says uh, we have no idea how much propofol to give to these patients. They still get hypotensive, and they do badly. 
if shock trauma can't do it right, I sure as hell cannot do it right. Okay? If shock trauma can't get a hypotensive trauma patient to write on a protocol, I have no shot at it, so I'm not going to try. No propofol for hemodynamically unstable, unstable patients. Propofol is great to make people fly. If I need to put in a tough elbow, I love propofol. In my healthy, sympathetically charged giant linebacker, which is the reason I can't get the elbow in the first place, uh, it's just not for this, in my opinion. What's this? Handle. I've heard it called that. Any other contenders? What is this? Antiquated. Oh, oh. Uh, the stethoscope I keep hearing is antiquated. Uh, I like the stethoscope. Uh, this is not a hand. It is a battery holder. That's the answer I'm looking for. That's the read my mind pimp question answer I was looking for. This is not a handle. It is a battery holder. If you think it's a handle, your grip is all sorts of screwed up. If you look at how people actually hold it, very little of their hand is on the handle. And depending on the device, it could be a lot or none. You know why this guy's hand is on the handle? Because it's a tiny handle with a tiny blade. That's about the only time that happens. You know the other times you see people's hand on the handle? Big hands. If I put my hand really low, I occlude my own view. My pinky manages to get in the way of my light source. I'm curling over the blade. How much of your hand is on the blade is depending on the blade and how big your hand is, and the answer is as little as possible, right? So there are micro skills to learn how to do the physical maneuvering of intubation, right? And depending on what book you open or what thing you read, Walls and Levitan and the, uh, Josh Farkas, this pulmonary guy, uh, oh, in the beginning, you have a light touch. You just easy, easy look, and then you get the grip low, low possible. Then you get the tensions on the tongue, not the jaw and the teeth, right? And your elbows in, you're going up and away from you. And this is all good advice, but when you watch people intubate, when my resident, who's like a linebacker and 6'3 and huge, is trying to intubate, and the bed's up as high as it'll go, and he's doing the splits to get his eye in line, right? That's different from me, who routinely intubates on a step stool with the head of the bed at 30 looking down, right? Actually, most people should be uh, on something and looking down at the airway. Again, why are they flat? Uh, but, uh, Nobody gets actual, I watched you intubate and you did this. So they'll say, oh, the elbow out here, that's mechanically inefficient. My resident is enormous. When he has his elbow in, right, he's too far from the airway. Oh, well, a bent elbow is, is bad. You lose stereoscopic vision. Your eye's all in here. And you're mechanically, again, difficult to get up. It's all wrist, and that means they rock, and that means they get teeth. All true statements individually applied. You need somebody to watch you too. If you assign a head of the bed guy and an airway guy and an access guy, uh, then, then just like I might ask Mike at the end of the talk, um, how fast were they talking really? Was it completely unintelligible? And expect him to say, yes, you suck. And I will take that feedback seriously. You need somebody to say, how did you get that in? Because from what I saw, it was all sorts of wacky, right? You, you should be doing that. Uh, you need somebody to give you some individualized tips on whether you shouldn't be doing the wide stance, split stance, knee bend. Like some amount of split stance, knee bend, I find is useful for tall people. And then they do the weight shift to get that uh, lift out and away and toward the toes kind of thing, right? Uh, which is a lot preferable to, I'm so close I got to use wrists and I'm rocking too much. Uh, so it's a little bit individualized, this stuff. Uh, you need a coach. You need a coach for this. You can, you can try, but, but really, uh, if you're doing it, you're not giving yourself good feedback. You ever see the CPR things where uh, the instructor watches the guy do CPR and says, that's too fast, that's too slow? We did this. We did a, a CPR contest. MICU attendings, group care guys, EMS guys, ER guys, attendings, right? Surgical PAs, all sorts of things. The teachers who watch it, videotape it, see the little green light when it's depressed enough, and tell the person faster, slower, deeper. When they do it, they suck. <laughs> they all need to be told the same things. Uh, you're not going to know. Curved or straight? Who really goes to a straight blade as their first pass thing? Nobody in the room, right? And that's pretty standard. So you say curved blade. So when you go, you ask for a what? <clears throat> 
Mac 4. A Mac 4. Why a 4? 3? 2? 5? Again? Can always pull it back. I'd rather not change a blade because I need a bigger blade. I'd rather just make do with a big blade and put less of the blade in the patient. Okay? That looks good. You asked for a Mac 4, somebody hand you this. Cool? It's a Mac 4. How about this? It's a Mac 4. That's that's a it's a Mac 4. I mean it's it's got a battery pack and it hooks up to a camera, but um, that's a that's a four. This guy that I showed you? It's actually got a little flange on the tip, and you can move this doohickey and make the tip flip up, creating the in the molecular epiglottis flip technique without actually learning how to do it. You hit the button. If you think I'm near the molecular, hit the button and it flips up, you go, yeah, it was. It's really nice. I also said and taught and did, I, so I reached for a Mac 4. I still do a lot, but I think that's because most of my patients have become Bronx normal large people. Um, uh, I think that a curved blade is a good first choice. Uh, I think that you guys are learning on hyperangulated video blades, right? We have options. What, what's your go-to? Is this is Jacoby still a direct laryngoscopy Mac 4 as a first try? Yeah. Or are we doing video primarily? Video Mac 4. So no. what do you have? You have no. C-Mac, no. GL. No. GL. Yeah. 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 I mean, not GL everybody needs training with us. Depends on the patient. Depends on the patient. So what I would suggest, and I know this is giant debates, and frankly, I kind of don't care about this debate that, 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 that much. I would suggest that the key things here are uh, a couple of things. One is the angles. This is absolutely flat. The neck is down and the head is, uh, is extended. Um, so, uh, so the line of attack is, is, is easy, right? You could just shoot a dart arrow through there. Uh, getting this view to see the cords is very, very difficult. Here, everything is flexed, so you have a better sight line, but tube delivery is difficult. So the key thing here is video versus direct. Yeah, they're different machines and techniques, but the key thing is in a direct laryngoscopy, the better the view, the easier the tube delivery. Because if you can see straight, you can put the tube straight. But my camera, my video, nothing to do with each other. Great view, perfect view, delivered the camera right to the cords. It went like down a windy snake path. There's no chance I'm getting the tube through there. Video, great view, doesn't imply great tube delivery. Right? That's why we need the hyperangulated uh, funny style to get that in, right? Keep those two things separate in your mind. I would suggest that if you're new, trainee, PGY1, I'm learning anesthesia, I'm getting my feet wet, you learn on this. Why do I think that? I think that because of the view. When you look in, and there's pink shit everywhere, you have no idea what you're looking at, three people look in, and maybe the third guy goes, no, that's what this is, that's what this is. Or maybe all three say, it's just all pink stuff. I have no idea what it is. So they, all, they all saw the same stuff, but they had a different interpretation. If you get used to seeing anatomy clearly on a video monitor, recognizing it in the navigating stuff is easy. I learned DL and then VL, but I suggest that you guys who are learning should learn VL and then DL. They're separate skills, and remember, in video, view doesn't equal to do. Okay, so, we did that part. Um, these are both Mac 4s. I happen to have American Mac 4s in my shop. The profile is much fatter, easier to break teeth, harder to rock. Uh, German is a low profile flange. Uh, there's a, uh, another Mac 4, uh, Canadian or C Mac Mac 4, a little different. They're all different. I don't know what you got in your shop, right? but pick a curved blade, uh, pick a blade that's got a lower skinnier profile if possible, uh, and for most patients, you're going to be achieving success with a curved blade a little more of the time than with this, and that's a weird thing to say, because you're going to say there's a study that glide scope's better and first pass is better. The thing is that the Things that glide scope wins that direct fail are different from the things that direct fail than glide scope wins. Honestly, if you had a CMAC or a store so you could actually do the direct maneuver with a curved blade and have the video so someone can see what you're looking at, then the view equals delivery is, is still there, but at least I have someone who can identify anatomy also. I think that would be the best thing, especially for an academic place. So, 
why not get more bang for your buck and have the direct and video capabilities that's, with the Mac 4 with video setup? That's exactly what a CMAC or a store setup is, right? It's the actual curved blade and you're doing it direct, but there's a fiber optic and there's a screen. And the, and the more experience can talk to and, you. And now I don't get it taken away from me because someone doesn't know uh, what the pink stuff I'm looking at is. <coughs> they can, I can get adjustments, you know, without letting go of the blade so I can learn better. But also, we're just putting the blade in and out less often, traumatizing the airway less. So I agree, and, and that's why stores are seeming, I think, would be a great thing to have. I happen to have two separate systems. I have a wide scope, the hyperangulated stylet, which may be in a trauma that you're really worried about the neck, which, I don't know, really worried that, that much anymore, but uh, that might be an issue. All right, use a stylet. You can see again, the angles are different, right? The movie's flexible, so it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, we say straight to cuff, but I feel like we don't show you guys, because all I see at the residence is, uh, is this business, right? And then we see anesthesia, who again, like, uh, uses no stylet, curls it in a little, uh, stick it in itself, Ouroboros snake kind of pattern, right? And then they pick it up off the patient's chest, which is dirty, by the way, don't do that. Uh, flip it open, and they put it in with no stylet. They say, see, that's a clean airway. Use a stylet. Why make your job hard? Try not to stab the patient with a stiff stylet, uh, and it can cause trauma. But use a stylet, and straight to cuff is useful for tube delivery because it doesn't include your view. I know. You've done curved for a long time, and I know it works, and I did forever. I gotta tell you, this is better. You come in sideways, the angle is so when you rotate the tube, you can rotate the tip in the plane. Once you're past the cord, you push it in, right? Some element of removing the stylet on the way in, like you learn on the hyperregulated uh, light scope setup blade, you know, pop, hold the tube, pop, and drop as you remove, might be needed even for a regular uh, stylet. All right, this is the most important angle, not this. Left hand says epiglottoscopy, not uh, laryngoscopy. Uh, if you're having trouble with your sweep technique, it's all pink. Go midline, go down the base of the tongue, find this thing. If you found this thing, you're almost home. And what do they tell you? They tell you below the epiglottis, above the area epiglottic folds, is the cords. Awesome. What do we hear? Find the epiglottis, go below it. What else lives down there? The goose. This is the anatomy that you should be learning on video and looking for. This is the first identified margin. This is the most important anatomy. Do you see vertical white stripes? Yes. Can you pass the tube? Yes. Pass the tube. Did you visualize it go through the cords? Yes. Great. Now we're going to check. OK? Let me show you a better view. The E might have been a hint. <laughs> S uh, so somebody gave this a name, put a case report, uh, glottic, uh, fake glottis, or glottic uh, impersonator, or something like that. Uh, so uh, here's one that uh, is uh, right off of Twitter, by the way. So uh, we probably shouldn't you know, disseminate for pay uh, this talk, which I haven't gotten permission to use this slide. Uh, but uh, here you can see that this. By itself, you might have thought, that looks bumpy and rigid, and maybe that's a little tip of epiglottis, and I see something below. But look, there's another one. So yeah, if you can identify both, that's best. If you see <laughs> the double bump of the areopiglottic cartilages, these guys, that is the most important anatomy. Because going above them is better advice than going below the epiglottis. OK? Why do you get this? You get this because of traction, right? I need the head and the soft tissue to fall away from my blade. I need to sometimes put enough force that the head is actually coming off the cushion. That's not a bad technique, but it does lead to this. All right. Follow through. When you tube, and they say, uh, I got the bougie in, so I'm good, and I'm going to stylate it over. When you tube, and you say, I saw it pass through the cords, right? The left hand is tired and wants to go away. Don't do that. The left hand, once you get your view, Right? They say, I'll stare down the cords, they have people hand it to you and don't move, right? You should stay while you're doing your confirmatory measures. When the tube is passed and you watch it through, the left hand stays, and you can sometimes see the area of lot of cartilage below the tube. Yeah, you sometimes occlude your view as it passes, but you should still be watching, right? When the left hand stays after the bougie is in, right? I, I love this thing. The bougie goes in, I think I'm in, I feel the things, I got a hold up, so that's carina. That's not the esophagus. You keep pushing, pushing, it doesn't go. The left hand is now relaxed, and they're looking to stylet the, the other thing. No, let somebody else do that, right? The left hand is keeping all the soft tissue off of your carefully styled bougie, right? 
The left hand is keeping your neck from doing flexion of your position changes. Right? That helps you pass the tube over the bougie. It helps you realize the chords. The follow through is the left hand stays until everyone says we're good. Okay? It's going to help you. Uh, and pre-slided bougie, you can do that, right? Uh, there are setups to do this. Uh, the big thing for me about the bougie is, uh, like the LMA, like some other things I talked about, why don't we do it more? If you use a bougie, you pretty much can't do an esophageal intubation. You throw this thing in, you say, I think I'm in, and then it goes in until there's this much bougie left out of the patient. You're like, there's no way you're in, right? Can it go the other way where you get holed up and you're not really in? Well, well yeah, but again, if you're doing left hand, and I saw the bougie, and then I stand up the cords, then you're done. Why don't we do this for every RSI? I like it. I do it. I make them buy more bougies. That's fine. Do it. End title is great. Like the bougie. We don't have a good end title waveform and misplacement of two. We don't have it. It doesn't exist. If you have end title, and you want to confirm two, the goal is nice, the listen is good, the visualize is awesome, this is going to give you information Post, you're going to notice when the paralysis squares off because of this thing, right? Uh, all right. What if you have a difficult airway that fails? What if I have a failed airway? What if I can't get the tube? When you fail, when you can't get the tube, when you have to do surgical airway, what will you do? Stop saying what if. You guys are young. It's going to happen to you in your career. It's not like a woman dying of ectopic pregnancy. In this day and age, you can be an ER doc, practice for 30, 40 years, and never have a woman die at the top of pregnancy. It's not going to happen for everyone. It's going to happen to you. Stop saying when. Stop saying if. When it happens, what are you going to do? We all know surgical airways are um, This is a thing called the vortex. It's a nice little uh, brain model of, of how you might think about it. It's got these three uh, quadrants here, right? This, this pie has got in the thirds, face mask. Uh, I can then ventilate you, get you back in the green zone, get your oxygenation. Uh, ET2, uh, attempt. And superbiotic airway, that's my LMA stuff, right? What they want you to do is see what you got. Are you here and you want to go there? Are you here and you're headed to ET2, right? Uh, every time you do an attempt at something, I can't bag you, right? And I'm going to try again. You have to change something. This is an attempt to not do the insanity of try again, same exact thing, right? Even if it's a different operator, what else can you do? So they say, let's change the position. Let's change an adjunct. Has the med not kicked in? Uh, what else is going on? You can visualize this vertically. You're circling the tube. And when you get not in the green, green zone is, is I did something, and I'm back to green zone. I'm ventilating, oxygenating at that time. Should we call anesthesia? Do we have a fiber optic option? Should I let the meds I gave him wear off and actually go to the rare awake intubation? Right? Forget this RSA. Call it off, right? Because I'm green zone. Or no, I gotta keep going down. We're not, we're not well enough in the green zone. Then I get to go around that thing three times, and that's it, I've circled the drain. So what this does is it prevents you from doing seven tries, which could waste time. But it also, when you have, when you feel like I have time, you might not optimize each attempt. Because that lets you go, oh well, this time I'll change the head position. Well, this time I'll change the stylet. Can we get, um, I think the meds are wearing off. It's starting to move. Can we do that? Uh, what else can we try? Someone, get, the, get, get that head a little elevated. Put your hand back here. Yeah. Let me do an uh, external laryngeal business. You help me. Six tries have gone by, but you didn't do one of those things in an optimizer. You could have done all of those interventions, and then the next guy in, and we're done. You get it, right? So this is a nice little uh, sort of model. I don't actually pull this out, uh, but I think it's a nice idea of every time you attempt, um, uh, that's a strike, right? If you give yourself three strikes, everybody knows it's surgical every time, right? At that point, it's, it's, it's the same idea as Emperor's DEF CON and putting a little mark on the place, and like, it just gives people the idea that, oh yeah, we're going. We're not gonna spend 10 minutes debating. If this doesn't work, we are going. Call ENT now if you must. That's what I got. What do you think? What did I say that was not, is not gonna happen in real life for you? <laughs> and you do prior intubation. And you do prior intubation. Fair enough. I barely do that. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's reasonable. What else? I think something that should happen is I, I don't think a lot of us do the, the positioning before the, the intubation. You know, there's a lot of flat intubations and a lot of, you know, uh, so I think that we, we should do that more here. Uh, I think it, you know, most of our airways are not emergent. 
Um, most of them are impending, but not emergent. So, so a lot of the time, we kind of have this nice, relaxed sense of, you know, I'm green zone. This guy needs a tube, we got time, let's yeah. do it in a controlled manner, we'll have a checklist if you want. And you know what? We're really good at tubes. Uh, we get tubes more than 99% of the time. Doing it better isn't about missing or not missing a tube. If you wait to miss a tube, um, it's like having, you know, I haven't had an accident in five years, um, but people flip me off in traffic all the time. Uh, there's squealing of brakes. I use the horn a lot, uh, and I got a bunch of tickets. You're really going to wait until you lose a side mirror and crumple your, your front end before you don't do that anymore? I mean, in this case, then your premiums go up. In this case, your patient dies, and it's the first time in five years that you got feedback that I shouldn't do that. So you can't do that, right? Uh, you have to say that every time you have a successful intubation, it's not good, right? I mean, a medical student can intubate. I, I let them. Uh, just because they did it, just because they accomplished the procedure has nothing to do with their skill level of doing the procedure, right? Uh, as an intern, you can get every single intubation you do in anesthesia. Because I did 72 tubes, got them all. I don't know what that means. I'm glad you got more than 35 tubes, which is our standard of get some muscle memory, uh, figure out what you're doing. But I would rather that you struggled with four tubes and learned a shitload, and your fifth intubation attempt has, has benefited from that, than doing a lot of easy tubes that you don't ever change. All right, so that's my take on it. Uh, if you're BVMing, it's not often, it's not massive positive pressure, pressure ventilation, it's not great seal often, but when it is, it's both hands, thumbs down to toes. When you oxygenate, try the nasal cannula as often as possible. Remind me, get the nurses in the habit. Uh, it's just it's still a little new. Uh, respect vomits. I hope it never happens to you. It's horrible when it happens to you. Uh, Premedicate, think about the doses, no propofol. Assign a role that's an extra role. You watch me and I want to hear about it, right? Hey, you person who's going to be my external laryngeal burp helper, hand me the tube. I also want to know how uncomfortable I looked and how much my arms shook and where my elbows went. And maybe I'll try it differently next time. Uh, learn VL, practice VL, go back and do both. Right? Just remember, visualization of cords is not too delivery when you're talking about video. Uh, and then uh, quick, so we talk. Push more, uh, LMA more, use the end time, you got it. Uh, and that's it. All right. Thank you.